All right, we can start on time. Notebook check Thursday. Notebook check Thursday. What should be in the notebook? It's a quiz. Everything, that's correct. Everything should be in the notebook. What are the other constraints for the notebook? Okay. Yeah, the weeks need to be labeled. So I need all 10 weeks on Thursday, not just the first six weeks. So all 10 weeks and everything week by week, right? Academic plan, anything that's turned in on the project, your notes from lectures, your notes from the project. What else? What are the other constraints for the notebook? If you remember them. Name on the front end and on the inside. This individual just put a sticky note on the inside. That's fine. I don't care. Name on the outside, name on the inside. Good. What else? There's one other piece. We got the week by week tabs. We have our name. Everything needs to be in it. Nothing loose. Nothing loose. You should go like this with your notebook. Nothing comes flying out, right? Nothing in these inside pockets. Like it's all got to be in the notebook, not in the pockets in the notebook. Okay? If you need me to print something for you, I can do that. Like you don't have access to a printer, or you don't want to pay for the printer fee here, just email it to me, say, can you print this for me? And I am a great printer service. It's one of the things I do really well. Okay. Questions on the notebook? Easy, easy peasy, easy money. All right, what's due today in this class? Problem definition code of ethics is due today. So I just kind of cruised the submission area. I haven't got many, so don't forget. Um, there it is, three of them so far out of 23 of you, so. Yeah, that's due today by the end of the day. So don't go on right now, right? On an hour, but by the end of the day, everybody submits. All right, things that are coming up. I removed the budget. There'll be no budget assignment. There's still a budget on the project in that I don't want you to spend money. So hopefully you've got that memo. If you need something, come to me or source it yourself for free. In the end, you will have to do a budget on your project if you were to go and purchase it. And that cannot be more than $300. So whatever you're using, think about the value of it and it can't be over 300 bucks. That makes sense? That if you bought it, I don't want you to buy any of them. So, but if you did buy it, what would the value be? That's part of the final packet write up is the budget for the project. It's kind of like the valuation of it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what else? There will be a guest speaker on Thursday. That's a pre recorded thing that's already up in the weekly folder thing. So, week six. That's today. There's Thursday and Fred's uh, guest speaker lecture, which was pre-recorded, is here. So the deal with guest speakers is, is you have to watch it. I think it's 41 minutes. You have to take notes and get those notes in your notebook. Not for this Thursday. You wouldn't have to because it's not due until the 19th, right? And then you also submit that to Blackboard, your notes. So cam scan or take a picture of it, whatever and upload, okay? These guest speakers will just start popping in and I'll try to always give you notice and then I always give you like a week to get it done. So your job is to watch it and take notes and try and learn something from other students that have transferred on, probably got their bachelor's degree, maybe got their master's degree and they just give you some insights on how to be successful and what, what they did to, to get through. Okay. All right. I think 
Yeah, we'll do structural analysis on Thursday. I think that's the bulk of the updates that I have. The next deliverable is the prototype and structural analysis, and we'll talk about that on Thursday. I'll prep you up. Questions on anything related to engineering? This class, how do community college? Weather. We're good. All right, let's talk about civil engineering. So that's today. So I have both civil and mechanical today. I'm going to probably compress these, try to get through both um, because we lost that week in there. So we'll scoot through a few topics. This is a PowerPoint that I stole. Part of it is a PowerPoint I stole from the University of Nebraska, because they did a really great job with their graphics, I thought. So we'll go through it. Civil engineering. But uh, yeah. It's like a database for shows off of. You would think, but no, not that I can find. There's a lot of like slideshow companies that will allow you to use their slideshow from the internet, but you can't download it. There's very few that I have found that you can just like download and do your own PowerPoint with it, right? There's a lot of Prezies out there that people have made and have put them up, but you can't download them. So anyway, yeah. And, and I, as I'm going through this, ask questions like if civil engineering is your thing or you're thinking about it, I have some information I can share with you, okay? Most engineering disciplines have areas. Right, mechanical is going to have kind of some different areas. Civil engineering is going to have different areas. Even electrical is going to have some different areas. Okay, so civil has these five areas: structural engineering, transportation, water resources, which I think is kind of part of environmental, um, and geotech. So we'll talk about each one. So you can. At most universities, when you're transferring, you can flavor your degree. So for example, you get a civil engineering degree, but then you're gonna get to swap in some coursework and that can be focused and that can lead you toward like transportation engineering. And then some universities will have like a whole nother year you tag onto it, right? So structural engineering, you're gonna tag a whole nother year onto your bachelor's degree to get your structural lessons. So some of these require more education, some do not. You just flavor the degree as you're going. So there they are. What do they do? What do civil engineers do? Mostly critical infrastructure. So what is that? Roads. Bridges. Water treatment and supply. Waste water treatment and disposal. It's a big deal right there. Talk about uh, a continued demand and need. That's not going away. That and that, water treatment and supply, wastewater treatment. The economy can go bad, but we still need wastewater treatment and, and disposal, right? So some of these areas are just continuous, not, not gonna change. Buildings, we always seem to be doing that. Railroads, that's part of transportation. Airports, part of transportation. That's a good question. I don't know of any that have gone away. I, some have evolved, changed. Um, what happened, so what happened during the economic crisis and then during COVID is we did 
clean house a little bit. In other words, underperforming engineers did get let go, which is very rare over time. Like over time, typically we don't let the engineering staff go, even if they're under performers. We'll cut in other areas to keep that that community full at the company. But companies did kind of clean house during those times. There were those economic times. Uh, but most all performing engineers, ones that are doing their job well, were fine. So yeah, they don't go away. They just kind of evolve, I think. All right. Environmental, what do they do? So if you go into the civil engineering branch, choose environmental, you're looking at air pollution, hazardous waste. Hazardous waste, we all know what that is, right? That's kind of some kind of chemicals that we just can't get rid of easily. Uh, water supply, wastewater management, stormwater management, solid waste disposal. Has there been sort of, I have an uptick in environmental engineering to like? Yeah, absolutely. Over time, there has been. So just with the recognition of kind of sustainability and sustaining our resources, resources being water, air, these are the things that, that humans need, right? Um, that sustainability movement developed a lot of new jobs. So there are sustainable engineers now at almost every facility that's doing anything. What do you Mountain Community College, we have a sustainable officer, right? That's his entire job, is the sustainability of the college. Um, and then most companies have that too. So that along with the environmental consciousness that you know we've been awakened in the last 50 years as to what we should be doing with the environment, um, that's developed a lot of a lot of jobs. Environmental engineering, water treatment and distribution. This is kind of the same thing. Air pollution, solid waste, and waste management. Wastewater treatment and disposal. So these are big, big areas now, big companies doing this kind of work. Any project that touches the earth is going to have these folks involved early on to understand the impact of what we're going to do, whether it's a building or a road or a bridge or anything like that, uh, the impact to the water, impact to the air, impact to the environment, impact to the migration of animals. I mean, it's it's pretty endless now. So to put a new road in somewhere is not a simple project anymore. You don't just do it. Not even in the forest. So, yeah. Environmental engineering courses offered by department. This is in Nebraska. Just to give you an idea of what the classes look like. I thought this was interesting just to look through it. It's a class called Animal Waste Management. I wonder what that's about. I have an idea. Anybody have any ideas what that would be about? Animal Waste Management. I don't think it's Nope. Yeah, yeah. If you've never been by like a feed stock um, situation where they have a thousand cows and you know one acre type of thing, there there's some animal waste going on there, and that needs to be managed. You can't just push it over into the river anymore. It's a nasty thought, isn't it? Ah, then like the civil engineering type classes. So those, you'll see like most of your very specific coursework is going to happen in that third and fourth year. First and second year is what you're doing now. It's really the preparatory year, right? Where you're prepping your math up, you're prepping your chemistry up, you're prepping your physics up, you're taking intro to engineering, all these kind of courses. Third and fourth year is where it gets real specific. So... All right, 
You might be interested in environmental engineering if you like chemistry, if you follow public health issues, you're concerned about pollution. All right, what do they do? A variety of things, right? So this is geotechnical and materials engineering, concrete pavements, foundation, dams, soil properties, site studies. This is all the support system for larger structures. Um, larger structures could be a road, right? So we want to build roads that don't fall away over time, like they do continuously on the coast. Highway 101 seems to fall away and wash out every year. Geotechs would be involved in that kind of support systems. So that's like, that becomes your entire job, right? Is, is designing these support systems for whatever loads are gonna happen on the ground, so. It's like it go up or it came down, one or the other. Geotechnical engineering, soil properties, materials engineering. We have a concrete and soils class on this campus, pretty fun class to take. You actually mix concrete and then you test the concrete and you do a few different mixes and then a few different tests exactly like they do when they're testing batches. So when we pour foundations, substantial foundations, not mostly, like this doesn't happen in the residential project. Uh, you do order your concrete at a very specific PSI because you can get a lower PSI or average or you can get a high strength concrete. <clears throat> but on a bigger project like a bridge or a tall building foundation, they'll run that batch and then they'll send samples also to the project. So when you pour the concrete, you get the sample. It's a cylindrical round cylinder of concrete. Then you can take that and test it and get your own material properties to prove they send you the right things. So you're not <clears throat> kind of hung out by the concrete company. So that kind of thing goes on a lot. All right, you might be interested in geotech if you like geology. So this is gonna be substantial groundwork. The outdoors, a lot of outside projects laboratories because there'll be a lot of bringing that sample into the lab and testing those kind of things. Um, you're interested in the elements that build civil infrastructure. So John Dryden, who's the normal full-time engineering transfer instructor, is a geotech. He'll be back next year. So if you're on campus, you'll you'll see him, you'll take him, and you can hit him up about all of his geotech work for the forest service. So he built bridges in the forest. Pretty fun stuff. How pretty remote. So for like logging companies, when they want to get into areas, they might need a bridge. So they hire geotechs to go out, design it, and then supervise the construction. So it gets built appropriately. Structural engineering. Pretty straightforward. It's going to be large structures and small structures. So anything that's out of prescriptive code is going to require what we call engineering. So when I do a project, if, for example, I was building a house or a small commercial building and they really wanted like this corner to be all windows, electrical windows all the way to the corner and then windows all the way down. That, that is outside of prescriptive code. There's no code for that. Right? What it does is it takes the strength of this wall away. Right? So in order to do that, you have to hire a structural engineer to say, oh, because you can't follow the prescriptive code to do it. There's no wall. But then they come up with the correct anchors and hold down in the rest of the wall that we just that corner state, right? So anything that's outside of a prescriptive code is going to take a structural engineer. And then obviously anything commercial structure. So anything above two stories, three stories, we get away with if we're careful, um, will require structural engineer. 
And they're going to be involved in the entire part of it based on their experience. So they could do the seismic also. So, I mean, the structural engineering that's got to happen is the foundation's got to hold up, right? Can't go into the ground. The structure's got to hold up to side load, that's wind. It's got to hold up to snow load and ice load and rain load on top. That's just down load. And then it's seismic. When the earth shakes, it's got to shake with it and not come apart. So we have lots of lots of things they can become experts in. Buildings, towers, and columns, dams, and bridges. Lots of physics, lots of mathematics, lots of computers and simulation, lots of greedy stuff. The calculations are pretty intense that they run for seismic and wind. Um, and shear, lateral load, those kind of things. Oh. Sample of bridge design. Looks like they're going to put a bridge in, put some big columns in. This is a pretty next level bridge. Oh. Yeah, you want to get your numbers right on this. You really want these pieces to come together. No, different codes in different states. Yeah. So there's a general code, and then codes become specific for the environment. Like the, there'll be a different code for different parts of the state, too. So there's going to be a different code at the coast than there is in the desert, right? We get a lot of different temperatures in the desert than we do the coast. So in the desert, we can we can have a range of 120 degrees, right? At the coast, not so much. Our temperature range is much smaller. So the thermal expansion in the desert, how much things expand in the heat, is much greater than how much things expand at the coast. Although at the coast, the salt air will chew things up. We don't have that in the desert, right? So the materials you might use at the coast be completely different than the materials you might use in the desert. Good question. Yeah. So would it start important there, like Borneo Valley, have to go more for like no? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Yep. Regional areas are going to be different. That's another great example of are the codes are different. Yeah. Yeah. If you are in the area of high tornado activity, then your whole down code is going to be totally different than here in Oregon. Although our hold down is still pretty extreme. Like in this area, it's a 120 mile an hour wind rating that you have to design for. It's the last time you saw 120 out here for wind. That would be like a mess. But our wind storms are like 60, 70 and we get excited. So we're designing for 120. So yeah, the codes are, you know, it's definitely regional and it changes. Your professional engineering license is state-based. So when you get your professional engineering license, that's an Oregon State Professional Engineer's license. You can't go over to Washington, although we have some reciprocity because they're so close and we're in Portland, uh, but you typically can't go to another state and do design. So you're not licensed in that state. Yeah. October 12, 1962 was the last time we saw 120 miles per hour. Was that the Columbus Day? Yep. Yep. I remember the Columbus Day story. Crazy. Knocked over our cherry tree. I think I just said that the other day in class. But <laughs> took out our pool. It was really frustrating. Good questions. Anything else? There it is. That's a substantial bridge. Man. What kind of a bridge is that? You know? A long one. Concrete one. Those are good answers. Huh? Suspension. Yeah, suspension bridge. So those are suspension cables that are supporting the bridge. So you can get away with a little lighter deck on that bridge because the cables come down and kind of hold up the midsections. So these midsections are just kind of hang hanging out here in the wind. These cables can run down and support that section and then you can make a little smaller deck. Good.
Structural engineering. Civil engineering or architectural engineering. Architectural engineering is a new discipline, like in the last, I'm going to say last 20 years. But 20 years ago, it really didn't exist anywhere. Oregon State just added it like four or five years ago. Architectural engineering is the mix of architecture and engineering. So an architect typically has very little engineering. So if you go to the U of O, very, very popular architecture program down there, you are going to learn all about structures, like different kinds of structures, but you're not going to learn about the mathematics of designing that structure. You're going to, you're going to primarily learn about space use, how to use the space. An architect would come in here and go, this is really poorly laid out. Because students can't really move around very well, they might change how the space is used. Does that make sense? When an architect does a design for a home or a hotel or a convention center, they're thinking about how the space is going to feel to you and how you're going to use it and what the flow patterns are. Right? Then they take that concept and they hand it over to structural engineers and say, can you do this? And usually we say, that looks pretty challenging to do. <laughs> There's some compromise that goes on, right? But really, architects straight up, they don't know how to calculate a beam. They don't know how to calculate a foundation. They don't know how to calculate a roof. They just know what they want it to look like. And they're very good at it. And they're very useful because we're very bad at space. So I don't know if I've told you house stories, but I built my own home. I designed and built my own home from the ground up. Every aspect of it, the concrete, the framing, the electrical, the plumbing, the heating, the roof, everything. I'm not an architect, so we have very small closets. I guess that's not a good thing. That's fine with me, right? I did it for myself and my wife, she didn't care. But there's not a walk-in, there's not even a closet you can even stick your head in there. So that's not good, I guess, I'm told. Ah, we have no coat closet at the front door. So when you come in, you just gotta like throw your coat somewhere because you would think of a coat closet, not even, right? So we have some flow problems in our home because we're not architects. We have really small bathrooms because who wants to hang out in the bathroom? That kind of thing, right? So architects are better at that than we are as engineers. They're really good at that kind of stuff. What's important in a home to a lot of people, not important to a home to me, obviously. I have a I have a living uh, rule in my life not to remodel things that I built. Like it seems just like if I didn't build it correctly the first time. I'm not going back and remodeling it. So yeah. that, that definitely drives my wife crazy. But that's just my thing. I like remodeling. I'd rather go build something new and move in. All right, let's keep going. So anyway, if you're interested in the, like the combination, OSU has a really great program, architectural engineering. And really it's an engineering degree that just filters in a bunch of architecture classes. So you learn more about space use. All right, let's keep going. We know what structural engineers do, but transportation engineering is a different thing. It is a subset of civil, and it's all about transportation. So we have a big port for Portland, a lot of transportation folks down there. We have a pretty substantial road system in this area and throughout the state of Oregon. Yep. Airports, we have some railroads, right? All of that would be transportation engineering. I was talking to this student just the other day, and that's that was his target transportation. So that's cool. Roadways, airports, port facilities, traffic control, pavement markings, intelligent transportation systems. I would think it's pretty difficult aspect of engineering to deal with because of the growth rate that you have to try to deal with. 
I would guess once you get that system built right there, it's already overloaded by the time it's built, right? So I don't know how you design that in the future. I can remember when I-205 opened for the first day. I know, that's how old I am. Uh, I was a lifeguard at a pool, Mount Scott pool. So I had to come from my home and I usually had to go back roads to get to that pool, but then 205 opened and I was on my motorcycle. And I got on it that morning. And there was not a car on the end. This is like capped all my gears and went as fast as I could. It was super fun. But now 205 is too small. It's packed, right? So yeah, that's a, that's a big problem. I don't really know how to solve that problem. Hopefully transportation engineers can figure that out. Transportation engineering, working with people, probably because that's going to be a municipality, right? You're going to work for the city of Portland. You're going to work for the city of Gresham. You're going to work for the state of Oregon. That would be transportation. Now, I would guess there's not a lot of private companies in that, other than the companies, the construction companies that are building the projects, the roadways, which I'll talk about that here in a bit. That's crazy. How'd you like that for your commute? Every day. Don't do it. All right. Water resource engineering. Civil's got a lot. So the big ones are gonna be the storm system, um, water delivery systems. So that's a basic human right that we all in this country have clean water, although we don't seem to pull it off all the time. We always get these news reports of these big cities and their water lead issues. So a lot of work in that area. Dams is probably a fading engineering area, probably. I mean, other than maintaining the ones that we have, we don't add dams typically. We're removing them at a faster rate than we're adding them. Irrigation systems, water distribution systems, groundwater modeling, that kind of stuff. Some of these developments that go in, housing developments, you know, just high density housing developments that go in, I always wonder like, wow, where's the water coming from and where's the waste going to? Like, geez, that's a lot of quantity there. The power waste, so the, the power lines and the power system, is typically like Portland General Electric will maintain that, but the development of those powerways, where we're gonna put them, how we're gonna put them in would be the civil engineering discipline. So powerways, roadways, waterways, that's all civil engineering, right? The actual distribution of the electricity would be for electrical engineering. So combo engineering groups working on that kind of stuff. All right, working with models like mathematics, you like the outdoors, you like harnessing the, to harness the power of water. Water resource engineering. A fair bit of this on the coast where they're managing a lot of water systems. Uh, inside of ports, you know, the, the port of Newport, the port of Tillman, the, all these port areas deal with a lot of waterways and a lot of water management. Difficult water management, harsh environment. But I always thought it'd be a great job, like water resource engineer, Newport, Oregon, live on the coast, have a great job, get to work outside in the yuck seven months out of the year, but then you get the five months that's just gorgeous. And, I don't know, be pretty fun. All right. 
career options, consulting firm. So there's always that. Uh, we have some big ones in the city of Portland. CH2M Hill is a big civil engineering consultant firm. So when the state of Oregon wants to do a big project, they're going to hire a consulting firm to do the engineering on that project. You know, if we're putting a big bridge, we're going to do something to the Fremont Bridge, or we're going to do something with the bridge downtown, like the new Tillicum Bridge that's been there for a while now. That's going to be a civil engineering firm that the state hires to put together that construction package and then manage that construction job. There are a few private civil engineering firms. You know, that a lot of surveying goes on in the state. If you want to develop land, one of the first things you do is got to, you have to have it surveyed so we know exactly what that land is. So there's a lot of civil engineering surveying firms out there. It would be fun to work with You're outside all the time. And then government agencies like Bonneville, you know, Power Administration, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, lots of civil engineers. All right. We're going to blast through salary expectations. We can do that. This is a little bit dated, but not bad. I would say this number is probably 65, 70 for starting pay. So this one's probably still pretty good, maybe a little higher. Of course, that all changes with experience and with you know, you get your professional engineering license and then go out and start your own civil engineering firm, you can do obviously a lot better, but you take on all that responsibility. All right, let's get to mechanical so we can, I don't have as many slides in mechanical. Mechanical engineering is the broadest, absolute broadest. Most folks choose it when they don't know exactly what they want to do, or they know they want to work with products, products that we all buy, any product, anything that's manufactured. Mechanical engineers will have their little fingers in, and most things are manufactured. Everything in this room, pretty much everything in this room was manufactured, from computers to tables to Clothing, chairs, right? Even the bricks. These bricks were manufactured. That chalkboard. You could be a chalkboard engineer. That sounds exciting, right? So all different disciplines. That's probably the most attractive part to mechanical. You can go into transportation and work on trains and buses and cars and bikes. Anything that is involved with transportation, right? Or you could go into the medical industry. All of that equipment is walk through a hospital or a doctor's office. All of that equipment is produced, right? So any sector of our economy will have mechanical engineering jobs. And that's a nice feature when one sector goes down. We have an energy crisis and there's lack of fuel. And all of a sudden we're not driving cars as much and we're not buying cars. Uh, that sector goes down, people get laid off, have a hard time finding jobs. Mechanical skin like this, oh, wiggle off into another area, right? So it is very broad, very broad. The areas of mechanical that you can focus in, again, it's super broad. I, the list, I think, could go on. You could be I did some design in my early days with the windsurf industry on windsurfing recreation equipment with the snowboarding industry. Worked with the Molly Snowports in Troutdale on their thermal processes. So the list can go on and on and on in the very specific areas for mechanical.
HVAC is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So that's one of our areas that we study. Manufacturing is manufacturing, nuclear is nuclear, that you would have more education. But Oregon State University has a great nuclear program. It's not advertised. Most nuclear programs are not advertised because they're not really, they don't really want to advertise that too much to the public that there's actually nukes going on in Corvallis, which is a little bit like, makes people tense, right? So a lot of folks don't even know there's a reactor. Shh, don't tell anyone. But they have a fantastic nuclear program. Like the jobs out of there are crazy good and there's not many students choosing it. So the competition is very low. Mechanical engineering, the competition is very high because we're all choosing it. <laughs> so then we have like 500 people applying to a job, right? So that's the, the pros and cons. Yeah. So you said that in your perspective, Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about drastic, but completely different. And I, I actually have some slides from some of the stuff that I worked on, but then I don't have stuff from. Um, all of Aunt Patsy's pasta automation system that I worked on. So I worked on really big stuff, really thick metal, and then I worked on really tiny stuff. So that was a big shift for me. It was like, wow, how do I do this? I'm used to these giant conveyors moving a rock, and now I'm building a little conveyor that's moving pasta. It's like everything was so cute. It was tiny. The little motors were tiny, and the little belts were tiny. And like, if you had one little thing off, it all just shredded. <laughs> and then on the big rock stuff, if you had one little thing off, it's just like, it didn't even matter. Like, because it was so redesigned. Anyway, we'll talk about that. Mechanicals, defense, large manufacturers and small manufacturers. It's just going to be harder to land the small manufacturing job. But all kinds of small manufacturers out there, like all these companies building these trailers that, that everybody buys to, you know, go trailering to haul their backhoe or to go camping in, right? Those are all small manufacturers, most of them. Um, consumer products, all of those. And then there's automotive, marine, and pretty much anything else, except for me. Defense is big, though, for mechanicals. My first job offer was a defense company, Sandea, out of California. Came to Oregon Institute of Technology, and they would just, like, hire any warm-blooded student you could be like 2.1 and they'd hire you yeah they didn't care they're just going to get you down there and make you productive somehow or get rid of you they were coming after the two-year folks but yeah because you can get in this at oit you can get this thing called an associate degree at a university which is pretty rare that you can actually get an associate's degree at a university but at OIT, you could get it. Like if you just did the first two years in your mechanical engineering program, you got an associates. And then Sandé was coming down to just like poke them, like just poaching these people and offering good money. It was like, hey, I could be done and just go build bombs. Like, I don't really want to do that. That's what they did, build bombs. All right. Here's some of the stuff I did. I worked for Kiwit as a mechanical engineer. One of my first projects was this train. So Kiwit is a construction company, right? Mm -hmm. Big. So they did big projects. For example, we, I was with them and we did the new Bonneville locks. So the Bonneville locks probably went in 20 years ago. Everyone know what a lock is? It's so how you get big ships to go past dams. Because the dam is like, Bonneville dams, like 60 feet water change, water level change. It doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot of water falling 60 feet. We can produce a lot of energy with that. But how do you get a ship, you know, to, to come down? So we build these basically small reservoirs and we bring the ship into that reservoir from above, close the gates, and then just empty the water out and then let them go. So going down is pretty simple. To get the ship to go up, you bring them into the low water, close the gates, and then open some valves and let water pour in from above and raise them up. So there's no pumping of water. It's super cool. But the tunneling system for that water to flow and to make that transfer fast 
because we don't want the bar just sitting there for four days. We want to, you know, 30 minutes, we want to get a bar to moving again. So the tunneling system was pretty next level that we poured into that place. I think I have some, I don't know if I have any drill rig pictures. We did some design on that, but this is a mechanic trailer. So mechanics work out of this. This Kiwit owns their own equipment. So all that equipment's got to be maintained. So we have this army of people that maintain the equipment. They need something to work out of because all of the jobs are on site. They're not, there's no structures, right? No structures at Bonneville that we get to use. We have to bring our own support equipment. So that's what I did. There's a lot of support equipment. This was super easy, right? I was super happy to get this project because really all I had to do was talk to mechanics and say, hey, what do you want? And of course, they had a long laundry list of what they wanted and how they wanted it laid out. So I just did what they wanted. It's a simple job. Uh, I was the conveyor guy. So Kiwit has its own rock crushing situation that they move into sites. So when they do a project, it's a big project. And they'll actually buy land or lease land, and then they'll bring their rock crushing equipment in. Because you need rock for everything. Anything that is developing the land, you need rock. Whether it's a roadway, a building, um, a foundation, you're going to need lots of rock. So you have a cone crusher where you put big rock in. And it munches it all up into little rock, and then the little rock needs to be distributed away from the cone crusher, or else you end up with a pile of rock on your cone crusher, and you don't want that. So that's what these conveyors did, is they conveyed the rock away from the cone crusher. So these are about 60 footers, I think. Uh, some of them can be pinned together. I think these, this might be a 120 that's pinned together in this end, so it flips open. See how the belt is on this side and this side. So this side would flip over and up and make a 120 long conveyor. 120 feet of rock, of maybe four inch rock on a four foot belt is a crap load of weight, right? And this thing is just like hanging up there at 30 degrees, moving this rock away. So there was some substantial design stuff I had to figure out there. That was pretty stressful. They really didn't want the conveyor to like fold up the first time it gets used. But once I had it down, I felt pretty good about it. And then they just kept asking me to design it. So I made a little spreadsheet where I could put all the inputs in and then pump out all the information out. So I didn't have to calculate it all the time. So I could design a conveyor in about two hours in the end where it took me like two weeks the first time. I didn't tell them that. I just kept like, you know, going out to lunch and filling them for two weeks. But no, I didn't. That is a screen, it's a Tyler screen. Well, I guess it says that right there. Uh, I don't design that, we buy a Tyler screen. And that's the same thing where the cone crusher crushes the rock, but then you have all different sizes in the cone crusher, right? So it spits out this rock and then we stick it into the Tyler. And then the Tyler has different screens where like four inch rock will come out one direction uh, two inch rock will come out another direction and then small rock might come out on this conveyor at the bottom. So it separates the rock, right? Pretty heavy piece of equipment. You're putting big rock in it. Uh, we designed the trailer that carries the screen. So the screen gets delivered. They say, hey, we need this screen in Hawaii. So it's got to go from where I was at the port of port at the airport to the port of Portland, which is a legal hall. So it's got to be legal weight when it goes down the road. So I had to figure out like what size axles, where the axles need to be. So this weight doesn't overload the axles and enough of it gets, gets put forward onto the truck that's following it. So it was a big balancing act, basically. That's your statics class that you'll take. I used that continuously. And then there was lots of strength of materials in that. How big do these legs have to be? Cause this is the position it's got to operate in, right? not going to haul down the road like this, haul down the road nice and flat. But when it gets there, they'll take a big crane, they'll lift it up, and they'll flip my legs down and set it down and then work it. And hopefully it doesn't shake itself apart because the thing just shakes violently. So, and then we had to put all the OSHA safety equipment. In. So those are, you know, those are the calculation and drawings that the mechanic puts here. Right. And then you work with the fabricators to get it built correctly. Good. That's probably uh, 
probably four month project on the first one. And then I think we did like six more on the screen started to change a little bit. So we had to modify some stuff, but yeah. Our job design, the, you can see electric motors kind of here and there, electric motor here, electric motor here. That's just driving the different wires and, and the screen itself. So those all those mounts got to be figured out, like where are we going to mount this stuff? So when you know, Fred's walking along here, he doesn't get chewed up by the belts. So there's some safety stuff that's going on. I did all the lubrication trucks. So these are support vehicles. So again, not the truck. We just buy the truck. It had no bed on it when it comes to us. And then I designed up the bed. This all of this stuff. So there's folks that run these trucks. They're called oilers. And they like to be called oilers. So they're oiling everything, right? They're oiling all the equipment on site. The dozers, the back hose, they just line them up. There could be 15 pieces of equipment on a Kiwa job, big pieces of equipment. That equipment cannot come down more than 30 minutes. And then it's back up. New operator, we keep it running. It's a construction business, man. They, they need to get it done. So when that equipment comes down, the oiler goes to work and tries to oil and lubricate all of that equipment in that 30 minutes. So this piece of equipment has to work perfectly. Everything's got to work really well. So it was really tough to figure out where everything goes. He had a lot of control or she had a lot of control over that. Like they gave me what they wanted. I had to fit it onto this package. There's a bunch of pumps. These are all different fluids. That could be hydraulic. This could be antifreeze. This could be engine oil. This could be more engine oil, right? Water, everything is on board. All these tanks got to get designed so they can legal haul down the road. Again, you can't be overloading the back axle. You'll get pulled over by one of those truck stops and then you get a giant fine. Yeah. If you design all this stuff, but let's see if they have an office or anything. Oh, yeah. This is our big building that we manufactured things in. And then they gave me an, a little dusty office to work out. Of. Yeah. There was four of us that had little offices down there. It was right on the fabrication floor. Like my window looked out right at a lubrication truck that they were building. So that was super cool because I was like trying to figure it out. They're trying to build it. They never give you enough time to figure it out. So they're building it as I design it. This is a mess typically. And uh, then I leave at six o'clock at night and then night shift comes in and just mucks it up. And then he fixes it the next day. And we carry on. This is how it went. Yeah. So are there like night shift engineers or are you talking like night shift? No, it wasn't night shift engineers. There was night shift fabricators okay. just trying to build stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, they when they were going, they were going hard. All right. Big backhoe bucket. See how big that monster is? Thing's huge. That's a flatbed truck. That's a semi truck. It's huge. So, yeah, we put it on a big old Kumatsu up in Kodiak where they were building jetties. And this was a quick coupler. This attached the bucket to the stick. So that's called a stick. This is called a boom. And this is a quick coupler, which didn't exist. So we designed it up and said, oh, yeah, we can do that. We'll just use really big stuff. And we did. It's made it really, really huge. Had some hydraulic drive to it so they could drop it, pick it up and drop it, which all buckets do now. But then no buckets did. So this was one of the first quick couplers on a large yard bucket. It was super fun to build. Big stuff's fun. That is a cone crusher. So that breaks up the rock that I was talking about. So I designed the trailer for. This is super heavy. So I had to stretch it way out. And then we had to put extra dollies on the back. See this extra dolly on the back? To get it to go legal all down the road. Here it is when I got it done. This is like a six-month project. And I lost years of my life on this one because it really had to get to the port and travel to Hawaii, right? So it, again, it only had like a 15 mile distance it had to go. I struggled, we struggled <clears throat> with pulling the deflection out of it. It just was so heavy and the span had to be so great to get it legal hole, to get these axles legal in the back. That when it actually went down the highway, it was clearing the highway by like six inches. And it was like, you know, I'm, 
we had a long talk and it was like it was not gonna go over like 35 miles an hour. 65, baby. I 84. I'm like, this is great. I'm not following him like you know. And it's just bouncing. I'm like, if it comes apart, it's gonna leave a divot in I 84 that is gonna be like a hundred yards long and like this dip. I mean, it was just gonna be so bad. Anyway, it made it barely. These legs fold down and yeah. And then they they were never supposed, it was never supposed to leave Hawaii, but they barged into California and I guess they tried to move it and it both finally broke it out. Like, yeah, that's crazy. Anyway, that was a bad one. This is a fun one. All right, I'm pretty out of time. This is a dolly. So the tunneling department of Kiwit came to us and said, hey, we just got a job in Seattle and we have to put this big pipe in a tunnel that we poured. And we never really figured out how we were going to do that. So now we'd like you to figure that out for us. That we got a lot of jobs like that where they'd estimate it, get the job, and then come to us and say, we have to figure out how to, like, because we bid this. So we just took a backhoe undercarriage, took it apart, and then put this big pipe dolly on it. And then you can see right there is the joystick. So you could literally hang this joystick like around your neck and then drive this thing around with a big chunk of pipe on it. So they just walked the pipe into the tunnel with we made three of these. And then they could just lift the pipe up, walk it out, and set the pipe there. It was super fun. This rolling this kind of steel, that's a big project. There's not a lot of rolls that can roll one inch steel. It's huge. All right, that's it. I was done. Joe no, knows that's more of it. See you Thursday. Yeah. I graduated in 85. Yeah. Yeah. So I was with Pete with 80. No, I graduated from high school in 81. I graduated college in 85. I was with Pete with in 85. Yeah. But yeah. Six years into it, I was doing some fun stuff. Yeah. Not nuts.